we continue Aleister Crowley's The Diary of a Drug Fiend by starting book three, Purgatorio. Note. The Abbey of the Lima at Telepilus is a real place. It and its customs and members of the surrounding scenery are accurately described. The training there given is suited to all conditions of spiritual distress and for the discovery and development of the true will of any person. Those interested are invited to communicate with the author of this book. Chapter 1. King Lamas Intervenes. Of course, some elements of Gregory Mathers are in the King Lamas character. It is only three months ago, but it seems a lifetime. My memory is now very good, and I remember more details of the past every day. I am writing this account the past three months, partly because my best friend tells me that it will strengthen it if I exercise it by putting down what has occurred in sequence. And, you know, even a month ago, I couldn't have recalled anything at all with regard to certain periods. My friend tells me that memory fails me in part because nature mercifully wishes to hide from us things which are painful. The spider web of protective forgiveness is woven over the mouth of the cave, which conceals the raw head and bloody bones of our misfortunes. But the greatest men, says King Lemus, are those that refuse to be treated like squalling children, who insist on facing reality in every form and tear off ruthlessly the bandages from their own wounds. But I have to think very hard to write down the incidents of the dinner at the Basteria, when Lou and I had made up our minds to end our lives. I had got some prussic acid from the chemists more than a week ago. It took us that time to make up our minds to get up, and to acquire Dutch courage enough to take the plunge. Some instinct prevented us dropping out of existence in a place like those lodgings in Greek Street, when all one's moral sense is gone. There remains a racial instinct in men and women of good blood, which tells them, like Macbeth and Brutus, to die positively and not Negatively. I believe it was this alone that dragged us up from the dirty bed from which we had not moved for weeks, sunk in a state which was neither sleep nor waking. It was by a gigantic effort that I got up and put some clothes on and went out and got shaved. Nothing but excitement and the idea of death enabled me to do it. I found the same thing in the war, and so did lots of men. It seems as if the soul is tired of the body, and it welcomes the chance to be done with it, once and for all. But it wants to offer itself gallantly in a flight or a charge. It objects to dying in a ditch. Passively, I am sure that nothing less would have gotten us up from that Wetted stupor. We had some champagne before starting, and then tottered giddily over the unfamiliar streets. There was something faintly attractive about the bustle of humanity. There was a momentary regret about leaving it, yet we had already left it so long, so long ago, in every intelligible sense of the word. We should, I suppose, have been classed as human beings by statisticians, but surely by nobody else. 
we could never return to the midst, and even in the midst of our wretchedness, we felt a repulsion of contempt for the ruck of humanity, which made us content to widen the gap between them and ourselves. Why preserve that word semblance of these futile insects? Even their happiness disgusted us. It was so stupidly shallow. We could see that the people of the Wisteria were shocked at our appearance. The maitre de hotel bustled over and made some sympathetic remarks about our not having been there for a long time. I told him that we had both been very ill, and then Lou put in, in a hollow voice, We shall be better tonight. Her intonation was so sinister that the man almost jumped. I was afraid for the moment that everything would be spoilt, but I saved the situation by some silly, joking remark. However, I could see that he was very uncomfortable and glad to get away from our table. We had ordered a wonderful dinner, but of course we couldn't eat anything. The mockery of having all those expensive dishes brought one after the other and taken away again untouched was irritating at first, and then it began to be amusing. I vaguely remember something in history about funeral feasts. It seemed singularly appropriate to start west in such conditions, yet we were participating in some weird ceremony, such as delighted the ancient Egyptians. The thought even came to my mind that we had already died, that this was our mocking welcome Hades, the offering of dishes of which we were unable to partake, and yet between us and the unknown was the act of drinking the contents of the little bottle in my waistcoat pocket. It was nearly an hour and a half since we had some heroin, and already the loathsome fumes of abstention were suffocating us. We had as much as our bodies could tolerate. We didn't want any more actively. It would do us no good to take more. But nature had already begun her process of eliminating the poison. In the body, morphine and heroin become oxidized, and it is the resulting poisons, not the drugs themselves, that are responsible for the appalling effects. Thus, the body begins to give off these products through secretions. Therefore, the nose begins to run there are prolonged foul sweats. There is a smell and a taste which cannot be called unpleasant. It can only be called abominable in the proper sense of that word, that which is repugnant to man. It is so detestable as to be unendurable. One might get relief by cleaning one's teeth or by having a Turkish bath but the energy to do such things is lacking. But if you take a fresh dose of the drug, it puts a temporary stop to the efforts of nature to eliminate it. That is why it is such a vicious circle. And these premonitory symptoms of abstinence are merely the fuetter of the foul breath of the dragon who is on his way to crunch you. Well, we find that with other drugs that suppress natural functions or faculties or however you're going to describe that, is that once they start to wear off, the body tries to fight back and return itself to normal. Um... If you make up your mind to endure the disgusting symptoms, the demon soon proceeds to more serious measures. Lou has explained in her diary more or less what these are, but even with the help of the poet, one cannot give any idea of what it is like. 
For example, the question of cold. The reader thinks at once of the cold of winter. If he has traveled a little and has some imagination, he may think of the chill spells of fever, but neither of these give much idea of the nature of the cold produced by abstinence. Our poet, whatever he is, his name is not given in the magazine, certainly succeeds in conveying to his reader the truth. That is, provided his reader already knows it. I can't imagine how it would strike anyone who has not experienced it, for he conveys his meaning, so to speak, in spite of the words. This business of expression is very curious. How could one describe, say, a love affair to a person who had never had one or imagined one? All expression does to wake up in the reader the impressions in his own experience which are otherwise dormant, and he will interpret what is said or written only in terms of that experience. Lamis said the other day that he had given up trying to communicate the results of his researches to people. They couldn't even be trusted to read words of one syllable, though they might have taken the best degrees in humane lectures, uh, le uh, humane letters at Oxford. For example, he would write, Do what thou wilt, to somebody, and would be attacked by return a post for having written do as thou wilt everyone interprets everything in terms of his own experience if you say anything which does not touch a precisely similar spot in another man's brain he either misunderstands you or doesn't understand you at all i am therefore extremely depressed by the obligation under which King Lamis has put me to write this section with the avowed object of instructing the world in the methods of overcoming the craving for drugs. He admits, frankly, that he feels it quite useless to do it himself, for the very reason that he is so abnormal a man. He even distrusts me on the ground that he has had so much influence on my life and thought. Even mediocrity like yourself, Sir Peter, he said to me the other day, dull as you are cannot be trusted in my neighborhood. Your brain unconsciously soaks up the highly charged particles of my atmosphere, and before you know where you are, instead of expressing yourself, what little self you have to express, you will be repeating in a debased currency the words of wisdom that from time to time have dropped from my refined lips there was a time when i should have resented a remark like that if i don't do it so now it isn't because i've lost my manhood it isn't because i feel such gratitude to the man who pulled me through. The reason is that I have learned what he means when he talks like that. He has completely killed out in himself the idea of himself. He takes no credit for his marvelous qualities, and has even got over kicking himself for his weakness. And so, he says the most serious things in the language of absurdity and irony, and when he talks, in a serious strain, his language merely accentuates the prodigious sense of humor, which, as he says himself, saves him from going insane with horror at the mess into which humanity has got itself. Just as the Roman Empire began to break down when it became universal, when it was so large that no individual mind could grasp the problems which it postulated, so today the spread of vulgar education and development of faculties for transport have got ahead of the possibilities of the best minds. The increase of knowledge has forced the thinker to specialize, with the result that there is nobody capable to deal with civilization as a whole. We are playing a game of chess 
in which nobody can see more than two or three squares at once, and so it has become impossible to form a coherent plan. Well, perhaps from a mundane point of view. But it does take more than one to work on it, right? King Lemus is trying to train a number of selected people to act as a sort of brain for the world in its present state of, cerebr of cerebral collapse. He is reaching them. He's teaching them to coordinate the facts in a higher synthesis. The suggestion is that of his old teacher, Professor Henry Maudsley, with whom he studied insanity. Herbert Spencer, too, had a similar idea, but King Lamas is the first to endeavor to make a practical effort to embody this conception in a practical way. I seem to have wandered a long way from our farewell dinner party, but my mind is still unable to concentrate as it should. Heroin and cocaine enable one to attain a high degree of concentration artificially, and this has to be paid for by a long period of reaction in which one cannot fix one's mind on a subject at all. I am very much better than I was, but I get impatient at times. It is so tedious to build oneself up on biological lines, especially when one knows that a single dose of heroin, or even morphine, would make one instantly the equal of the greatest minds in the world. Well, so they think, right? Because um, you're not focusing on as much, so you can focus on, you know, bits of it, right? Um, we had decided to take the prussic acid in our coffee. I do not think we were afraid of death. Life had become such an infinitely boring alternation between a period of stimulation which failed to stimulate and of depression which hardly even depressed. There was no object in going on. It was simply not worthwhile. On the other hand, there was a certain hesitation about stopping because of the effort required, we felt that even to die required energy. We tried to supply this with Dutch courage, and we even succeeded in producing a sort of hilarity. We never had a moment's doubt about carrying out our program. The waiter brought two Pex Melba, and as he retired, we found that King Lamus was standing at our table. Do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law came his calm voice. A sudden flush of hostility suffused my face. We've been doing it, I answered with a sort of surly anger. And I suppose the great psychologist can see what's come of it. He shook his head very sadly and sat down without being invited on the chair opposite us. I'm afraid not, he said. I'll explain what I mean on a more convenient occasion. I can see you want to get rid of me, but I know you won't refuse to help a man out when he's in trouble like I am. Lou was all sympathy and tenderness at once, and even in the state which I was, I was aware of a feeble movement of hate both towards her and him. The fact is, that man's mere presence acted as a powerful stimulant. It's only a trifle, he said, with a curious smile. Just a little literary difficulty in which I find myself. I was hoping you might remember my giving you a poem to read a little while ago. His tone was airy and supercilious, but yet there was an undercurrent of earnestness in his voice which compelled the attention. Lou nodded easily enough, but I could see that in her heart, no less than in mine, an arrow had struck, charged with acid venom. The reference recalled the dreadful days at Barley Grange, and even the bottomless pit of nothingness. 
into which we had since fallen, seemed less outrageous than the lake of fire through which we had passed. The poem rang through my brain, snatches of the anthem of the damned. His elbows were upon the table, his head between his hands. He watched us intently for a few moments. I want to quote that poem in something I'm writing, he explained. And can you tell me the last line of it? Lou answered mechanically, as if he had pressed a button. Death is not a way out of it. So, he understood what they were up to. But if Lou had not had a reaction of tenderness, then, you know, perhaps things wouldn't have stuck at all. Thank you, he said. It's a great help to me that you should have been able to remember. Something in his tone caught my imagination vividly. His eyes burnt through me. I began to wonder whether there were any truth in what was said about the diabolical powers of the man. Could he have divined the reason for our coming to the cafe? I had the absolute certainty that he knew all about it, though it was humanely impossible that he should. Well, if the chemist knew that they were trying to kill themselves, you know. Um, a very strange theory, that about death, he said. I wonder if there's anything in it. It would really be too easy if we could get out of our troubles in so simple a fashion. It has always seemed to me that nothing can ever be destroyed. The problems of life are really put together ingeniously in order to baffle one. Like a chess problem, we can't untie a real knot and a closed piece of string without the aid of a fourth dimension, but we can disentangle the complexities caused by dipping the string in water and such things. He added, with an almost malicious gravity in his tone. I know what he meant. It might very well be, he continued, that when we fail to solve the puzzles of life, they remain with us. We have to do them sooner or later, and it seems reasonable to suppose that the problems of life ought to be solved during life. When we have our hands apparatus in which they arose, we might find that after death the problems are unaltered, but that we were impotent to deal with them. Did he ever meet anyone that had been indiscreet about taking drugs? Presumably not. Well, take my word for it. Those people get into a state which is, in many ways, very like death. And the tragic thing about the situation is this, that they start talking, uh, they start taking the drugs because life, in one way or another, was one too many for them. And what is the result? The drugs have not, in the least, relieved the monotony of life, or whatever their trouble was. And yet, they have got into a state very like that of death, in which they are, are impotent to struggle. No, we must conquer life by living it to the full, and then we can go to meet death with a certain prestige we can face that adventure as we faced the others the personality of the man radiated energy the momentary contact with his mind had destroyed the current of thought which had been obsessing ours yet it was a fearful pang to be torn away from the fixed idea which had imposed itself as the necessary conclusion of a course of thought and action extending over so long a period. I can imagine a man reprieved at the foot of a scaffold, experiencing an acute annoyance at being wrenched away from the logical outcomes of its tendencies. Cowards die many times before their death, and those who have decided whether with their will or against it to 
put an end to their lives must resent interference. As Schopenhauer says, the will to die is inherent in all of us as much as the will to live. I remember a lot of fellows in the trenches saying that they dreaded being sent to the base. They would rather have it over than take a temporary respite. Life had ceased to be precious. They had become accustomed to face death and had acquired a fear of life of just the same quality as the fear of death that they had at first. Life had become the unknown, the uncertain, the dreadful. A hot, fierce wave of annoyance went through me like a flush of fever. Damn the fellow, I muttered. Why 